everybody. We got a treat for you today. We are joined by Julia Campbell. She is a rock star in the storytelling world, a nonprofit, and I know we are all going to have so much to take away from today. So we're so excited to dive in. I wanted to share a little bit about Julia before I pass it over to her. But she is a mom of two, returned from the Peace Corps volunteer. She's the author of The Storytelling in the Digital Age, which is an incredible book that we want you all to get your hands on. Um, it's a call to action for nonprofits to use their stories to accomplish missions. Julia's based in Boston, where she is literally the global authority on digital storytelling. Holla. Guys, we are in the Just company one, of one giants. Of them, not Z. <laughs> <laughs> A. Fair enough. Um, but she has got served clients across the world and the globe, and so she is here to share her expertise with us today. So, I, Julia, would you mind just filling in a few of the dots that I missed and just share a little bit of how you got here today? Wow. Well, I started my journey in social good when I, well, I don't, I guess I really started in college. I probably started in high school now that I think about it, volunteering, just being involved in social justice and activism all throughout high school. But college, I worked for nonprofits. I did internships with um, nonprofits. And then I served in the Peace Corps where I was in Senegal and West Africa for two and a half years, uh, right after college. And I met a lot of people that worked for NGOs and charities and did some fundraising projects there. And it just really transformed the way I thought about my career. And then I served as a development director, marketing director. I've pretty much done everything inside a nonprofit except for executive director. I never held that title. But then I left the sector formally about 10 years ago and now I do consulting and speaking online courses designed for the, like the really busy resource strapped nonprofit social media manager who's Which just kind of struggling right? to <laughs> figure it all out and navigate all of the digital tools that are at their disposal. I think it's so interesting to one, just a major high five to you for being a Peace Corps member, because to me, that is like the epitomization of sacrifice sacrifice and selflessness to go and serve out in the world. So thank you for doing that. Um, mm -hmm. I just also think it's so interesting that we're, you have made a business on pairing two things that terrify people so much <laughs> in nonprofit, <laughs> which is how do I write? They're telling, you know, their themselves that they're not a writer and, mm -hmm. and w there's so many platforms. There's so much that's going on digitally every single day. There's this overwhelming sense of, I can't keep up. And mm -hmm. you have taken the two and sort of woven them together. Notice I didn't say mash because it is very much an <laughs> art form. True. Um, and I just, I, I think that's wonderful. And I, I'm really excited to hear what you have to tell our listeners today about why this is not such an insurmountable mountain that yes. you can climb this. There's really two prongs to it. And when I started my business, it was a hundred percent focused on social media and teaching people how to use the platforms. Then what I realized is that the principles of communication and fundraising apply no matter what platform you're using. So if you don't have the fuel of fantastic stories and a compelling narrative to share, it doesn't matter. You could be on TikTok all day and it's not going to resonate with people and they're not going to make a connection to you. So I, I started to shift you know, more into how do we strategically and intentionally collect and craft and share our stories and then use social media to really amplify our message and our mission. So rather than start with, how do I get on Twitter and start tweeting, start with, well, why are we using it? What are we going to be sharing? And what kind of stories are we going to be conveying? Yes. So in that, I mean, you're really advocating mm -hmm. that there's platforms that are built for each nonprofit. Like some of them are going to be that they're going to speak more clearly to you than some of the others. Yes. And trying to figure out where your audience is or what your storyline is that fits better. It's trying to figure out what you're trying to accomplish and where your audience spends most of its time. So who are you trying to attract? The other piece of it though, is what do you like to use? Because yeah. what I've been finding, especially in my consulting work is if you absolutely hate Twitter if you hate it, you know, you're not going to find a lot of success on it. So if it just pains you to be on it every single day and tweeting and hashtags, and you just genuinely do not like it, it is going to be hard to get traction. So if you're more attracted to like a visual storytelling platform, like Instagram, or if you're attracted to a blogging platform, like medium or Tumblr, 
or maybe you're attracted to like a Facebook group where you can really build a community. It's more about where your audience is, but also it's a little bit about what does your nonprofit stand for? What are, you know, what's going to really work best. If you have fantastic visuals, then you should probably be on a visual storytelling platform such as Instagram. If you have great videos, you need to be on YouTube. So it's a lot about content. It's a lot about audience, but it's also about what's going to work best for your particular capacity um, and the resources available to your organization. But I love that you just gave us all permission to say no yes. <laughs> to platforms. Thank you. Because Burden that's a lifted. sigh of relief. I mean, just even like yes. throwing out TikTok, it's like, most of us don't even still know what TikTok is. I'm sure it is a blast. It sounds well, like we're TikTok, not at the demographic. I mean, so this is might be very controversial. Yeah. I let my daughter, who's turning 11, set up a TikTok account. Now, what I found is that they have the best parental controls of any social media platform. Interesting. I can mirror it to my phone. I can control who she follows. I can control who follows her. And I can limit her time on it to an hour a day or less. So I've actually been really enjoying it. And we've been spending a lot of time on it together. And I've been seeing it as a tool for me to teach her how to be responsible online and how, to, you know, what to look for. And it's just, it's been a really interesting learning experience for me. So I love that. Props to TikTok for having really great parental controls. But it might be banned soon, so who knows? I don't go out the window. <laughs> I don't know. One of the things I really liked about your website was uh, is just the real speak and the genuineness of how we talk. And I am so thrilled to see that social media is taking those first uh, tentative steps away from the sort of Norman Rockwell type uh, presentation on our social media accounts. And it's like, mm -hmm. that is not real. And it's like, mm -hmm. we all have had that FOMO of, you know, oh, yeah. my, my family doesn't look like that. My nonprofit doesn't look like that. These are the things I'm not doing. And we're kind of moving into a, here are all my warts and mm -hmm. I'm still lovable. And our mission is still impactful. And this is why we have need. And I wonder if you could just uh, talk about what you've seen um, as a trend, uh, especially mm -hmm. with nonprofits to kind of go down from this top level, only share the good stuff and actually share some of the real stuff too. It's hard. It's hard for nonprofits, right? Mm -hmm. Because we want to put our heads down, do our work, you know, raise money and make an impact, but we don't really want to celebrate ourselves. We don't necessarily want to shine a light on what's going on behind the scenes. We're, we're shy. We're not necessarily wanting to put ourselves out there, but that's what people are craving now from the brands and organizations that they follow. So I am a big fan of the, I don't know if you know about the Edelman trust barometer. They do a trust survey every year of Americans and only like 40% of Americans trust nonprofits. And I Ouch. think wow. I know that was shocking to me. Um, or extremely trust at those different levels. Mm -hmm. But what that shows me is that we need to be more transparent and we need to be more accessible. And people absolutely love that off the cuff, in the moment, authentic storytelling. So the two tools that I really like using for this are live streaming. So going live on Facebook, going live on Instagram or Periscope, whatever it is, how, whatever tool you want to use. And then using the stories feature on Instagram or the stories feature on Facebook, because those features are used more. People are consuming more Instagram stories and Facebook stories than they're actually consuming newsfeed content. So we're, we are just absolutely craving this human connection online because we're so, we've been so inundated with the perfect influencers that are Photoshopped and you know, all airbrushed and everything like that. I think you're absolutely right. That's going away. So for me, I just think you need to, you need to look at your organization with the eye of a journalist and you need to be a little bit of a detective, like what's going to be interesting. What's going to be, maybe it's not interesting to you, but it might be interesting to your audience. You know, what goes on day to day? What drives your organization? Who's working for your organization? What are the volunteers doing? What does it look like on the ground day to day? And a lot of what nonprofits do, they don't think is going to be interesting to other people, 
But I think especially right now in the climate we're in, I want to know, are you opening up? Are you not? What's going on in your state? What's going on in your locality? How are you, you know, what are you doing with staff? Are you working remotely? All of those things are very interesting to me as a donor. So as much as you can kind of lift the veil on some of the inner workings of your organization, I know it makes nonprofits non- uncomfortable, but those are the stories that are, are really going to help build that deeper connection with your supporters. That's something we really believe in, just like being able to be okay with sitting in discomfort a little bit because it's not yeah. normal. And, and and that is how we want to radically change things in a great way. And I would also add to your incredibly insightful statement that this is a time not only to, you know, be visiting with our donors and talking about what we're doing, but we should be talking to each other because yeah. never before in, in our lifetimes ever have we yeah. been all in the exact same boat. And we want to know, what are you doing that's working? What has not worked? And we really need to be kind of standing on each other's shoulders, lifting each other up because, you know, uh, yeah, rising. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I have an example. I was actually just on a call with a client today and I will not name the organization, but, and I, I love you dearly. If you're listening, you know, exactly <laughs> the development director, but she sent me their annual appeal letter and it was four pages long and it was literally looks like it could have just been taken out of the website. You know what I mean? It was just like, this is our mission. This is what we've accomplished. It was just big blocks of text, all data, um, very like very jargony, very heavy, very weighty. And I was saying this all, it really all could be improved if you just started with a story. If you grab my attention in those first few lines, and this is for a direct mail appeal, or if you just told it from the perspective of the executive director, you know, I said, what if the executive director talked about an experience that she's had during the quarantine or during coronavirus that immediately would draw me in and make me feel a connection with her. And then I'd be more likely to read the whole letter. But if it looks kind of like a form letter, you know, or an annual report or a brochure, I'm probably not going to read it to the end and not make an emotional connection to give. So I think we get, we get, stuck in our heads where we have to, we want to give so much information and so much data and we're, you know, we're doing such awesome stuff, but we have to remember that there's a human being at the end of that communication and what's really going to convince them to give, especially if you want them to give then to open up their wallet is that emotional, that sense of I'm in the right place. This organization understands me. You know, do you know what I mean? I do. And I have to tell you, Julia just brought back like this repressed (laughs) childhood memory I have. Not childhood because I was like 22. But I remember sitting in my first nonprofit job, which Mm. was a science museum. And I am charged with writing a direct mail letter. And it's my first time ever. I'm a young professional. I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I remember reading all of these examples to get an idea of what they were looking for. And I remember in my little 23-year-old mind going, there is nothing about what has been written in the past that inspires me. Is this my job? Is this the world that I'm entering? And, you know, thank goodness you can fast forward and see that you became an enlightened human being and you figure out how to write your own narrative because it's true. Four-page direct mail letters. Nobody wants to read them. Longer supposedly does work, but not four pages. Two at the most. That's like stereo instructions. <laughs> yeah, I don't, and lots of white space. I mean, there's a whole science and art to direct mail, especially in terms of visuals and things like that. But I think if you don't have that hook right off the bat, if I don't, if I don't instantly connect with you, the person that's writing the letter, or if you have a copywriter write it, but I have to pretend that it's a person writing this to me. If I don't instantly connect with that, the first two sentences, I'm going to just toss the letter aside. So it's just so important to have some kind of personality and remember there's a human at the end. There's a human at the end of this. And, you know, think about the kind of things that resonate with you. Think about what you like to read. Think about some of appeals that really resonated um, with you personally and go from there. Love it. Well, if we could, I want to backtrack to when you were talking about using Instagram and Facebook stories. I know that's super hot right now. Um, 
just from your perspective, how do you bring an executive director along? We're speaking mm-hmm. to a lot of listeners that, you know, are, are innovative. They want to bring new ideas to the table. How do you bring a board or an executive director that may be stuck and doesn't see the value in telling this kind of different story um, yep. than what's traditional? How do you coach somebody through that? You need to have a plan. So what I like to do, I like to call it like your five point plan or your three point plan. So what you don't want to do is just go to a board meeting and say, we should use Instagram stories because (laughs) no one knows what that means. It's very vague or my favorite, we should start telling stories. Okay. What, What does that mean? So break it down into the like who, what, when, where, why, and how, you know, what exactly are you talking about? When is it going to happen? How much time is it going to take? Show me examples of what other organizations are doing. So compile um, screenshots or links, um, you know, take, keep them on your phone and you have to really show the executive director and the board, this is what's possible. This other organization in our same industry, our same, you know, cause area is really doing awesome work on Instagram. I mean, you're going to have to do some research and as long as you can show them what's possible and then tell them about the anticipated results. So this is a little more challenging because you can't say we're going to post 10 Instagram stories a week and we're going to raise a hundred thousand dollars. Like there's not a direct correlation. It's not like email where you can, you can say that, you know, because you can look at the data behind the email. Instagram stories are just a great way to connect with a younger audience and to really be more relevant, you know, to really, um, to tell your story in that visual and compelling way. So I think as long as you have a little bit of a plan, you might not know exactly what you're doing first, but you, as long as you can go to your executive director with more than just the idea, um, that's always what I recommend. So examples, a little bit of a plan. If it's going to take some of your time, how much time, if you want to have an intern do it, who, how, what's that going to look like? And what are the reasons behind you doing it? That's such good advice because the intentionality of it is really where, where the strategy comes in. I mean, we don't want to post to post because, you know, posting because your competitor is on the platform and you want to add another voice is not a compelling reason no. of why should we should be in this space trying to engage with people. So we don't need more noise. At, that's exactly right. P- particularly not at this uh, time of life and in history. Mm-hmm. Um, we would be completely remiss if we did not have a master storyteller on our podcast <laughs> and didn't give you a little bit of room to share, you know, some of these stories that you've been able to witness through your work of transformation. And I wonder if you could just give us sort of an interesting case study from inception to completion of a client that you worked with um, yeah. that you helped kind of craft this narrative and the impact of that. So I was really lucky to work uh, with fight with an organization called Fight Colorectal Cancer and their national organization raising money for research um, and advocacy. And they do some direct support for people that have been diagnosed or survivors um, of colorectal cancer and their families. So they are pretty well known in that particular community. Um, They wanted to reach new people. You know, we all do. They wanted to reach new donors. They were running, they wanted to run a Facebook ad campaign and a Giving Tuesday campaign, do a series of emails, series of direct mail appeals, but they were getting stuck on they just had the one story, you know, they feel like they had the one story of someone that was sick and someone that got help and then someone that is better. And the challenge with that is it's simply a recounting of things that happened. And if I read that as a donor, I think everything's fine and there's no sense of urgency or timeliness for me to participate and help other people. So you also don't want to be, of course, you do not want to be exploitative in your storytelling. I mean, ethical storytelling is just kind of goes without saying, at least in my work with clients. People can't but see you me, never but want I'm to be exploitative. air Well done. That's yeah. a great point. But you want, you don't want to sugarcoat things either. Like cancer sucks. Cancer is horrible, right? So you might not want to say cancer sucks. Like some people do in their communications, <laughs> but I just don't believe in 
tying everything in a bow at the end, especially because that doesn't complete the whole picture. So what we decided to do, because they were feeling that they were just stuck on the same, the same story, same story, is we took stories from 20 different ambassadors and we crafted emails from them in their voice, telling their story and asking people to participate. Um, and we crafted for each story that we had, we did an email and we did a um, Facebook ad and just a standalone social media ad. And it just was so well received because it was all different perspectives, very diverse, different ages, different um, genders, you know, different ethnicities. It was just, we tried to make it as, we did make it as diverse as possible, but it was also a diversity of stories um, and just perspectives and people, the donors really loved that the emails, you know, we, we did write the emails with the person, but they came from this person. So it wasn't, you weren't getting five email appeals from fight um, colorectal cancer. You were getting an email appeal from Jane and an email appeal from David an email appeal from Stacy, whoever, you know, so the vocabulary, the names of the people. The tones so of the that was something I was really proud of that we worked on and it actually worked really, really well. So don't feel like you have to have one story to tell it all, like one ring to rule them all, like in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> we don't, we don't have one story. There's multiple perspectives that can shed light. And I think we actually have a responsibility to tell these stories and even a moral obligation to be telling people about the problem that we solve and bringing people along to help us solve it. I'm trying to pick myself up as from being a <laughs> pedal on the floor right now, because I, I want to double click on this because I think what you're saying has so much merit and it's a way that we are not wired to think as nonprofits. When we think mm -hmm. about the organization's voice, you are exactly right. There is a voice, there is a tenor, we build that. But what we don't think is that the nonprofit has many voices from different slants, yep. depending on where, in your case, colorectal cancer intersected with an individual. It could be a story of mm -hmm. hope for someone who had a family member that recovered, but mm -hmm. it could be a s story of loss and devastation and, and trying to find the meaning of making sure this doesn't happen to another family and another. Mm -hmm. And the mission is still the same. The key messages are still the same. But again, mm -hmm. seeing that from a different slant, I mean, I can't even imagine the way that that would personalize and bring the motion like straight to the front of why we do what we do. Yeah. And I, what I liked the most about it is, I mean, some of the stories are not yet written, you know, so they're not ended. They're still in the middle of the story. And so it gives the donor an opportunity to say, well, I really want to be part of, you know, sounds cheesy, but like writing a happy ending or shut, you know, giving a new um, chance to someone else. So those kinds of stories can be really powerful too. And I, we just get so focused on the, you know, beginning, middle, end kind of stories tied in a bow. And I think we have some maybe stories that are fraying at the edges a little bit that are rough around the edges that we can still tell and have a great impact. That's okay. Uh, do you have tips of just how you draw a story out of a person? So, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't, I was not a communications guy. I was the design guy. So I've, you know, grown in this in my time at a nonprofit doing interviews with donors and videos and things like that. But I still find it hard sometimes to pull out the right questions or figure out what the right triggers are. What are some ways you could counsel us and kind of give us some of your best tips on that? Sure. Well, I'm fortunate that I study journalism. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sort of primed for this. Teach I <laughs> studied magazine journalism Grass at Boston University. Thought I was going to be traveling around the world, you know, writing for Rolling Stone or, you know, the Atlantic or something. Um, I love writing and I love interviewing and talking to people, but it really is a skill. So if you, if you feel uncomfortable, write down some questions beforehand and run them past someone or look at other stories, like look at stories in the news and look at stories some, not even necessarily fiction, but stories all around you and see what are the key elements of a good story. And the, some of the key elements are, you know, emotion. So rather than simply asking someone what happened, 
you do want to ask them, how did that feel? How did you feel when you came to us? How did you feel after this happened? How did that make you feel? Because that's the essence of the story. It's not just Sally was homeless. Sally came to the homeless shelter. Sally got help and Sally left. That's not a story. That's not a, that's just a recounting of things that happened <laughs> sort of in a row. So how did Sally feel? How did Sally look? Do you know what I mean? How did, like, what was the emotion in the room? What are some descriptive details that you can pull out? Like, what was she wearing? Um, what was it like outside? Was it 30 degrees outside or was it 90 degrees outside? So thinking about like all the little details that you can write down and it's helpful to have a story intake form. So um, I just ran an online course called Storytelling That Sticks and it was all about collecting, crafting and sharing stories. And it was a six week program and that. we created story intake forms. So each nonprofit would, I, you know, I gave them a template but it was a series of questions that you could ask and adapt and you just keep it in your Google drive. And that way other staff members can use it. You can add to it, depending on who you're talking to, you can take from it or, um, you know, you can edit it in any kind of way, but making sure you have a series of questions ahead of time. And my number one tip is never ask somebody. So, so what's your story? Tell me your story. <laughs> Because that's overwhelming. In 1945, I was born on an, on an old farm. Yeah. Very and close to my mother like, at the time. Yes. <laughs> well, do you know what I think about? So we just watched The Goonies last night. Oh my um, gosh. Yes. Oh, such, such an incredible such a movie. Great Fun movie. Tip. So when the uh, Fratelli brothers and the mother have Chunk and they remember they're interrogating him. Oh yeah. They, they have the they blender. start from the beginning. <laughs> and do you remember what he does? Oh he my god! Literally gosh. recounts. It's like a confessional with a priest. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so you don't want to do that, okay? You don't want to say start from the beginning or tell me your story. You want to make sure that you're providing context and you're asking leading questions. And and your your recipient feels safer in that space. That's I would think more there's so much work that needs to be done even before you get in that room. Like I think a good example is you know when I was I was a development director at a domestic violence nonprofit, and I'm from Boston and I was in working in Virginia, and I came in and it was my first development director job. I just moved there and I came in in a very Boston way, right? This is what we want to do. I've got so many ideas. Here's what we're doing. I'm a journalist. I'm going to, I'm going to whip this place into shape. I'm going to collect all these great stories. And that wasn't the culture at all where I lived in Virginia. And I had to do a lot of trust buildup because, and it makes complete sense. The program officers were very protective of the women in the shelter as they should be. So they did not necessarily know what I was going to be doing with the stories. They didn't know how I was going to talk to these women. So I had to build up a lot of trust in the beginning to even be able to get in that room. So that is 100%. It's if, if you don't have that layer of trust, then you're not going to get that authentic story. And also in terms of ethical storytelling, you have to be very clear and upfront about how you are planning on using the story and telling the person they can opt out at absolutely any moment, like any time. I don't care how far down the rabbit hole you are with video production, they can opt out at any time. They have complete agency and making sure that it doesn't seem like a quid pro quo thing, mm -hmm. because a lot of times clients are fearful that they're not going to be able to get treatment or be able to work with the nonprofit if they don't share their story. So yeah, I mean, there needs to be a lot of work in on the front end before you even get to the place where you're, you're asking questions. And there is just such a tender walk, you know, mm -hmm. in so many of these causes, you know, you talk about a domestic violence shelter and it's like, we have to wade into those waters very carefully. And oh, so yeah. trust is such an, a great component. I love that you brought that up. And I also think just not making it business as usual is helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I go and interview somebody, 
I want them to be as comfortable as possible. I want to take the first five to 10 minutes and just chat. I want to look around their office and say, oh, I see you have grandkids, or is that your dog? Or Mm -hmm. tell me about this award you got. And it's like, there's some camaraderie there where it's not just question one. You know, we want these interviews to feel organic and it will stem from sort of how you approach uh, this interview, Mm -hmm. I think. Think about how you would approach a major donor or any donor. If you're going to have coffee with them, or even if you have a Zoom call, the first thing you say is not, okay, let's get to brass tacks. Are you giving us (laughs) $5,000 or what? You you do exactly what you said. You find that camaraderie, you talk to them. It's just leading with compassion in all of your communications is the best way to do, the best way to do things. I have a tip when I write emails that I just learned. So I'm, like I said, I'd like to get to the point. I just, that's, I like to do that. I don't like a lot of like BS and I have to remember, I have to pull back. Are you sure you're a female? No detail. (laughs) I'm just like, no. So when I write an email, I write the email, like I get out what I want to say. And then I make sure I add something at the top and I add something at the bottom. And just every time, unless it's a, you know, somebody I know really well or my it's husband. It's almost a compliment something. sandwich but approach, right? It really is. <laughs> what you it really just need to helps, say. <laughs> it just helps slow things down, calm. And I think especially in the climate we're in right now, leading with compassion and making sure people are feeling safe. And, and also just really, you never know where somebody is in their headspace ever, but let alone right now. So yeah, coming from a place of compassion is important. I, I love listening to you and I love listening to great storytellers speak and, um, and, and like, there's no level of guile or pontification. I mean, it's so wholesome and pure. And that's what I really love about the authenticity that you're bringing. I'm wondering if you could share with our guest, just a powerful moment that you've experienced in your work, um, whether that be on the front lines doing Peace Corps work or um, as a consultant or a frontline fundraiser. I mean, where have you seen mission come together and just affect you in a very profound way that you never forgot it? Well, there are quite a few from the Peace Corps, but I I want to tell a specific story. And I remember I said, I was going to cry and surely try not to. I've told this story so many times speaking in front of hundreds of people, but there was a suicide and addiction, suicide prevention and addiction treatment center that has since unfortunately closed that I worked with locally in the beginning of my consulting career. And so, you know, I'd go in and I have meetings with them and we talk on the phone and you, for some reason we would have meetings usually on Fridays, like around the end of the day. And I'd always be there around like four or five o'clock. And this man would come in every, I can cry every Friday at like four o'clock and he would just give a $10 bill to the receptionist. So after I noticed this a few times, I said, what is that about? Like, shouldn't we talk to this guy? He's probably got a really great story. And it turned out that his son had died of a drug overdose and he was in high school and that was his allowance. Like, I can't, I know. So every Friday he gave the $10 and he wanted to come in person with the cash. And they'd never, they'd never thought to ask him like, what, why are you doing this? What is this about? And it turns out, I mean, the, one of the most impactful stories I've, I've ever heard. And now of course he's like the, when they started to talk to him, he really wanted to share the story. He got more involved. He even got on their board. I mean, it was a whole thing that just showed me that these unbelievable stories are just, they're in, they're in your community, they're in your organization. And if we just step back from like putting out fires every day and trying to wrap up what we were doing and like really just take a good look at even some of our donors, I mean, these stories are, are there. So I know I've told that story so many times and it still chokes me up. The tears the are invitation. like right here on my chest. <laughs> They're so close to coming up my throat because know, it's just because now that what, I, what, I didn't oh, have the humanity, I had a baby at the time, so I didn't. I couldn't even imagine, you know, what this father had been through, but it was just the powerful act of 
physically going and giving that money. And that to him was him honoring his son's life, but also what it did for him when I talked to him is he said it, he made, it made sure that he never got complacent, you know, like he never forgot about his son and his mission and how he wants, he doesn't want other families to go through that. Proof positive that you don't have to be a millionaire no. to affect positive change in a nonprofit. You can do yeah. it $10 at a time, walking it in, in an unconventional way. Um, and I can imagine when he was engaged at a greater level, he probably found maybe a little bit more peace. I hope he did. I hope he found more hope yeah. and um, found his place that it was beyond just walking in the act of walking and it over. It showed me too, because it showed me about the power of giving on the individual. It just meant so much to him to have this routine that he did every week. And it, ju it just, the, the power for him in his personal life was absolutely transformational. So it's interesting, you know, we think about donors and we have a donor file and, you know, we, we qualify them as major donors, small donors, but really, I mean, about all of this, at the end of the day, there are people at the end of all of these communications and they have, they have some incredible stories to share with us. It's like, what a calling to stop and ask for those stories and get to know people. I mean, how much would have been missed if, if they wouldn't have just paused to hear that, the background of that. Wow. And what Thank a you. wonderfully selfish thing that we can do for ourselves to pause in our work and be reminded of why we do what we do. Yeah. Because something like that has me feeling like, how do we need to le lean in more? Who am I mm -hmm. seeing walk by that has been there the whole time? We all have checks that come in that we don't know who is attached to them. They just come in. And so drilling down into that can kind of bring us back to the heart of worship, I guess that's <laughs> what it is, the heart of the mission. So that was a powerful story. Thank you so, so much for sharing that. We'd love to hear mm -hmm. about your book, um, Storytelling in the Digital Age. Would you tell us a little bit and our listeners about, about why you wrote it and you know, kind of what mm -hmm. they can expect? Five-star average rating on Amazon. The folks, Yay! Love this book. <laughs> so I, Storytelling in the Digital Age came about because I, I'd been contacted by Charity Channel Press, um, the publisher, and they'd wanted to do a book on social media because that had I'm still known for that and that's what I started out as being known for. And then I started thinking that book, I don't know, it just wasn't going to be evergreen enough. And then of course I did go on to write a book about social media, but that was my second book. But the storytelling book, I thought that nonprofits, especially small ones, they needed a step-by-step -step guide how to collect and craft and then share stories. So that's how I framed the book because I found that they just needed a blueprint. Like, okay, I know storytelling is important. You don't need to write an entire book about how important storytelling is. I get it. You know, that's the introduction, but then get into the meat of how can I do this as a staff of one? How can I build a culture of organ um, at my organization that embraces digital storytelling? So I didn't want it to just be a standalone book about storytelling. I wanted to incorporate some of the digital principles in there, like website, email, and I touch on social media and how to really amplify your stories once you've spent so much time collecting and crafting them. So to me, it really has all of the pieces. It's like a roadmap for especially small nonprofits who I really love. I mean, they are just my, Jane. they're my people. Yeah, um, we love them. I, yeah, I love big nonprofits too, but I love small nonprofits. We see you the nonprofits. The DIY bootstrapping nonprofit that maybe they're an accidental fundraiser, maybe they're an accidental marketer, maybe they switched their role, maybe they're a social worker by training that came into the director of marketing role, whatever it is, they need a guide and they need some hand holding. So that's how I designed um, the book. And that's really kind of how it came to be. Thank you for being an advocate for those siloed individuals <laughs> that are tr wishing they had 10 hands because they just yeah. have so much on your plate. I think that's a great resource. I found it on Amazon if anyone's looking for it. And we also will make sure that we include a link to your website in our show notes. You know, one of the, yeah. we asked two final questions in our sure. uh podcast and one of them is what is your one good thing you know that you that you could offer to our listeners a piece of advice 
secret to your success, maybe a habit. Um, what is your one good thing, Julia? My one good thing, I was trying to think of something that maybe so nobody else said, because of course it's, you know, get enough sleep and exercise and drink water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, Preach. um, my one good thing is, uh, done is better than perfect. So for me, I am a perfectionist and I really, I work on things way too much, probably hours longer than I should just ship it. Like, you know, Seth Godin says, just ship it, ship it. you know, when it's ready, then your audience will tell you. So for me, I mean, done is better than done is better than perfect or done. It, per, uh, done is better than um, not done. Really good is better than perfect. Julie, I know you love that. I love that, especially from mm -hmm. someone who's an accomplished author and multiple books. I mean, how do you ever say I'm done? Okay. No more editing. You can never, you can't, you just have to do it. You just it. have to set a deadline and says how long I'm going to work on it. And when it's to a point where you can be proud of it, um, and nothing is ever going to be perfect. Perfectionism, perfection is an illusion. Pipe dream. Mm -hmm. So one last question we ask sure. everybody, why are you for good? What inspires you to wake up and serve nonprofits, philanthropies on the daily? She going. Wow, I've, I mean, we're all in this big, crazy world together. So I've just always been a believer that we are put on this earth to help others. That's really, it's just always been my belief. Um, I was not raised in a religious household, but you would almost say that's my religion is that we just, if you can help someone, if you see an opportunity to help another person that you should. And nonprofits, I mean, the, they're the unsung heroes, especially of the coronavirus crisis, but they're the unsung heroes of every kind of crisis you can imagine. You know, working on the front lines or working in the background where you never see them, sleep, not sleeping, hardly taking a paycheck, you know, working, for these causes that they just, they care so, so, so much about. And I know personally, I mean, we all have something that we're passionate about. And what I want to help nonprofits do is connect with those people that are passionate about what they do so that it's a win-win for both sides. It's a win for the donor. It's a win for the nonprofit. The donor is passionate about this cause, is passionate about this mission, wants to help solve this problem, and they get a better sleep at night because they are helping. And then the nonprofit has that connection with the donor. So that's why I'm for good. An excellent answer. And we can tell that Julia is the master crafter of what you, you. do in your craft, because I'm in the same boat with you. I had a journalism background and you are so hardwired <laughs> and at the university level to write a news ed, keep it factual. And I'm here to tell you new grads, journalism mm -hmm. grads, there is something so freeing to be able to use your adjectives, make mm -hmm. a story colorful and go into the feature side of crafting these stories and writing and because it's so wholesome and fulfilling. So I thank you for kind of bringing the heart of that back to our guests and sharing all of that with us. I love journalism. I really do. I read it. I consume it. But yes, I definitely enjoy feature journalism a lot more. Excellent. <laughs> And I am so grateful that we had someone named Julia on the podcast <laughs> because it gives me such a megaphone. Mm -hmm. uh, John's laughing that I'm going to bring this up here at the I'm very end. Of this. This is one I of have, my fears and I have a six year old named Julia. She is the beloved hey. light of my life. And I have just realized how hard it is for people to say Julia. And so <laughs> oh, it's try not buying two syllables. something with the name Julia on it. Like, it's you know, not, you it's go not to the on many keychains. And they have the license plates. <laughs> yes. It's always Julie. It's not Julia. <laughs> <laughs> it's not two syllables. It's three. Like yes. Julia Roberts. Not Julia. Not Julia. Julia. <laughs> that made John paranoid. A lot of people call me Jules. Jules. And you're like, so maybe didn't she'll give get that nickname. That. <laughs> well, Julia from Boston, you are a delight. You have you. truly capture the heart of what we are trying to perpetuate as we Thanks. continue to encourage our nonprofit peers to sort of rise as we take on this new level of talking with our donors and connecting with our mission. So thank you so yeah. much for joining us today. You can you. Uh, learn more about Julie uh, <laughs> on her. <laughs> right I'm See, looking at uh, Julie as I said it. This is it. my life. I live in fear around <laughs> Becky's sweet daughter. 
daughter. Because uh, I'm sitting right name. here. You don't get judgment <laughs> from me, John. So check out her website at jcsocialmarketing.com. She's got this incredible book, Storytelling in the Digital Age. There's information about that on her website. And also you can just grab it on Amazon. Very reasonably priced. Um, and we just love spending time with you and uh, soaking Thanks. up all of this uh, good advice that you have for us today. Thank you. I'm really happy to be on here. And to the nonprofits listening, you've got this. You're doing great work. Thank you. We're all in this together. Awesome. Have a good one, Have a good guys. Day.